Hi everyone, it's Dr. Annie Fenn. I'm a physician, a chef, and the founder of the Brain Health Kitchen. And I'm really excited to be here with you all today for Brain It On, where we're gonna be talking about all the ways you can nourish your brain. So today I thought it'd be really fun to make an easy frozen dessert that you can enjoy all summer long. So I'm gonna show you how to make wild blueberry frozen yogurt. It's super easy, I promise. You don't even need an ice cream machine. Here's what you'll need. Three and a half cups of frozen blueberries, one cup of plain unsweetened yogurt, a few tablespoons of maple syrup, and just a tiny pinch of salt. Now, you can use any kind of blueberries you want. I'm using wild blueberries from the grocery store, but you could also use regular blueberries, you could use blackberries, you could use berries that you brought home from the farmer's market and that you froze yourself. Now make sure that your yogurt is super cold right from the fridge and make sure that it's unsweetened. I'm using a plant-based yogurt because I love cashew milk yogurt. Um, I don't want you to have any yogurts that contain added sugar because there's gonna be plenty of sweetness from the blueberries, number one, and number two, added sugar is just not good for your brain. So what you're gonna do is get out a food processor. You could also use a blender, works completely fine. Add your blueberries to it. Add your yogurt. And we're not gonna add the maple syrup yet because you know what? Sometimes blueberries are so sweet that you don't really need to add any sugar at all. So I'm gonna have you blend this first and then taste it. And if you still think it needs a tiny bit of additional sweetener, we'll add a little bit of the maple syrup. I'm also gonna add a pinch of salt. Not too much, but a little bit of salt can bring up the sweetness of the berries. All right, ready? 30 seconds to wild blueberry frozen yogurt. I'm gonna stop and scrape down the bowl a little bit. Oh, it's looking really good. And there you have it wild blueberry frozen yogurt. So easy, just a couple ingredients. And everything in this dessert is good for your brain. From the wild blueberries that provide fiber and flavanols, especially anthocyanins, which are super brain healthy phytonutrients, to the yogurt, which is a good source of protein, as well as probiotics that will help you cultivate a healthy gut microbiome, which your brain loves. I really had fun making this with you today and I'm happy to answer any of your questions about cooking and eating for brain health in the panel discussion. Mm. Really good. Hello, my name is Dr. Wendy Suzuki. I'm a professor of neuroscience and psychology at New York University, and I'm so looking forward to participating on the panel called Keeping Your Neurons Firing part of the Brain It On event on June 24th, sponsored by Hilarity for Charity and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement. What if I told you that there was something that you can do right now that would have an immediate positive benefit on your brain, including improving your mood and your focus? And what if I told you that those brain benefits were long lasting and could protect your brain from aging, and neurodegenerative disease states like Alzheimer's disease. Would you do it? Of course you would. I am talking about the transformative power of physical activity that is moving your body to improve and protect your brain function. And we're gonna be talking about the neurobiology underlying that as well as restorative effects of sleep for your brain. Why does our brain need sleep? Why does it crave sleep? And why aren't we getting enough sleep? I'm thrilled to be joined and to be led on this panel by our panel leader. Uh, you know her from stage, screen, and her amazing dancing abilities, Miss Julianne Huff. Julianne and I have worked together before and talked about the amazing power of physical activity, not only for our bodies and for our brains. But I'm gonna tell you the real reason that I want each and every one of you to join our panel is if you've never worked out with Miss Julianne Huff, don't miss your opportunity because we are going to be doing a quick little experiment together, working out together 
to really experience the brain changing and mood boosting effects of exercise together. So looking forward to seeing you all on June 24th. Hello, my name is Deb Glasser, and I'm the head of the U.S. Alzheimer's franchise here at Biogen. We are proud and honored to be a sponsor of today's first Brain It On Summit. Thank you to our friends and colleagues at HFC and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement for your commitment to brain health education and for your amazing work in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. The innovative work that you do from promoting brain health to a younger generation, to empowering and celebrating caregivers, and to bringing awareness to the disproportionate effect that Alzheimer's has on women educates all of us. As this group knows better than anyone, Alzheimer's is a complex disease and it will take all of us working together to address this major health challenge. On behalf of the team at Biogen, thank you. We could not be more proud to work alongside you. Hello, I'm Ivan Cheung, chairman of ASI Inc., a global pharmaceutical company that for decades has been committed to the creation of new treatments for Alzheimer's disease and the advancement of holistic ecosystem solutions for the Alzheimer's community. Thank you for joining the Bring It On event led by the Women's Alzheimer's Movement and HFC. Today's activities focus on the importance of early interventions and lifestyle modifications to help live a brain healthy life. ASI is proud to be a sponsor and stands as a willing partner with the Alzheimer's disease community in our efforts to help eradicate Alzheimer's and related dementias together. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Dharma Singh Khalsa, President and Medical Director of the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. I'm delighted to be here at the Brain It On conference with Maria and Lauren and all the other experts. What I'd like to share with you is our research on a simple memory meditation exercise known as Kirtan Kriya, a singing exercise. So it goes like this. It has a breath and the breath is just natural. Let the breath just come and go. There's a posture. You sit up straight like a yogi and then there's a mantra or a sound. In this case, the sound is sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. With each time that you touch the fingers, you're gonna be saying the sound. So it's sa, ta, na, ma. This mudra activates the brain. So you have the breath, the posture, the mantra, the mudra, the fingertip positions, and then you're gonna have a little focus of concentration. Each time you say it, it comes in the top of the head, out the forehead. So it goes like this, just easy. Sa, hands, remember, on the knees, I'm just picking them up. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa. Silent. Now we're going to whisper. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Sa, ta, na, ma. Then you inhale at the end of the 12 minutes. Bring your energy up, up, up. Excellent. To find out more, please go to alzheimersprevention.org. And I just want to remind you, this little memory meditation can prevent and reverse memory loss. It can create a lot of positive changes and create inner peace and spiritual fitness. Alzheimer'sPrevention.org. I'm Dr. Dharma Singh Khalsa. Thank you very much.
Hi there, I'm Seth Rogen and welcome to Brain It On, a summit for people smart enough to make their brains a priority in their lives. So congratulations on being one of those people. Today's event is being hosted by HFC and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement and features incredible experts, scientists, and doctors who will share information on how to help you improve your brain health and prevent Alzheimer's. You will have the choice of joining one of four breakout sessions focusing on nutrition, exercise, the power of mindfulness, and what women need to know about their brains. And just because we believe in having fun, we have some special non-geek guests as well, including Apollo Ono, Liz Hernandez, Julianne Huff, Rocco Despirito, and more. Best of all, you have two amazing hosts, Maria Shriver, founder of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, and my wonderful wife, Lauren Miller-Rogan, founder of HFC. And now, let's brain it on. I love that. Let's brain it on. Hi, I'm Maria Shriver. And I'm Lauren Miller-Rogan. And we are so excited to welcome you to the very first Brain It On, a health brain health journey for you. We are going to take you all through your brain. We are going to tell you everything you need to know because we're both super committed to this cause, to your brain, to preventing Alzheimer's and bringing you the very best experts and doctors to help you take care of your brain. So both of us, we're friends. We're fully vaccinated. So don't worry, we're, we're close together. But this is the first time we've kind of brought our two organizations together because we thought it'd be so much more fun to collaborate yeah. and bring our forces together. And HFC has made such a huge difference in this space. Tell everybody Thank a little you. bit about what you've been doing, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm so excited about today. Um, we started HFC uh, back in 2012 to honor my mom, Adele, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when she was only 55 years old. Um, and in those years, we have really focused on helping caregivers through their journey, whether it's providing care for them or support groups um, or tools that they need to become better caregivers. Um, we inspire young people to tell their story and to become advocates, because when you reduce the stigma, that will lead us to the end of Alzheimer's. And of course brain health. Everyone who has a brain is at risk for getting Alzheimer's. And we want everyone to feel empowered and to know that four out of 10 cases of Alzheimer's may be preventable if you lead a brain healthy life. And that is a huge priority for us at HFC. And I'm so excited to get started and tell everyone. That is so important for all of us to know, because when I got involved, when my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so we're both kids of Alzheimer's, back in 2003, there was no hope in the prevention space. Nobody was really talking about brain health. They weren't talking about prevention, and they certainly weren't talking about women. So the Women's Alzheimer's Movement was founded because we reported to the nation for the very first time that women were two thirds of those who get Alzheimer's, also two thirds of the caregivers, as you well know. And Wham wanted to find out why that was. Why does a mother like uh, Lauren's mom get it at such an early age? So we've been funding research and trying to support caregivers in this space and educate people about what they can do about their brain health to begin their brain health journey in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, 60s and 70s. It's never too late to get going, which is why we wanted to bring the very best experts to you today. It's never too late to embark on this journey. And it is a journey. We've both been on it. We're not only out there kind of trying to educate people and inspire people. And Seth and Lauren, I want to say, have brought so many young people uh, to this cause. Oh, thank you. I, you know, we, we're, we're trying. It's never too early to start taking care of your brain. And I think that there are so many young people who have been touched by this disease, yeah. whether it's as children or grandchildren of people who've had the disease. And something you mentioned a minute ago is you want to take action. You want to feel power over a disease like Alzheimer's, which can yeah. often leave you feeling powerless. Right. And learning about your brain and how you can keep it healthy has given me so much energy in this journey. And, and it's such an exception thing that you can do. You can actually do it. Yeah. And I've been to some of the events that Lauren and Seth put on. They bring humor into this. Uh, they bring hope into it. And we try to do the same with the women's Alzheimer's movement. And I firmly believe that if women were really focused on this disease, we would be the catalyst to find a cure for it. Because when we put our minds to something like this, what, no matter what it is, 
we get results. And that's why we have, we're co-anchoring uh, this special. This is my great co-anchor. I'm trying my best to keep up with the pro. <laughs> she was like, as long as you lead, I'll follow. I'm like, okay, no, I'm going to follow. You're the actress, so you're the director too. But we also want to thank so many great sponsors came together to put on this event so you can uh, come to this event for free. We have over five thousand people who signed up. We have the best doctors and researchers and activists and advocates. And you saw some of the people who are uh, moderating these breakout panels. We tried to bring you uh, the very best so that you could attend this. And we also want to ask you to support these organizations by donating. Yes, we want to do ask you to donate. So you go brain 91999. Now, did you get that? I may have spoken that too fast. You go brain nine one nine 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 and you can donate a dollar five dollars whatever uh you can afford whatever you think might be helpful and we want to say that anything you donate is really helpful and that we're going to actually pick five people from the people who donate to join us for the after party after we all break out for these sessions and then we kind of come back together and talk to the moderators about what they learned and that's what's so exciting is so many of these moderators wanted to be involved because they want to learn. They want to be on the brain health journey with us. So that's what's super exciting. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so excited to hear what everyone has to say. And the truth is living a brain healthy lifestyle can make you feel better. I feel good when I get good sleep and when I exercise and when I eat healthy and when I keep my brain active. And these things are not things that have changed my life in a negative way. They've made it better and it is so doable. And I'm, I'm just really, uh, every time uh, Seth and I start talking to people about what they can do to keep their brain healthy, they lean in, they listen, yeah. like, oh, I can do something here. Um, and there's so much good information. And I'm very excited to, to tell everyone about everything. Yeah. And that what's exciting, as I, I was saying, that having been involved in this for many decades before, it was kind of dark. And now it's hopeful. As I said, we're talking about prevention. We had big news in the Alzheimer space uh, a week ago with the Biogen uh, drug that was approved by the FDA. They're one of our sponsors mm -hmm. uh, on this. You heard from them at the beginning here. And a lot of researchers that we're talking to are saying that they're hoping that that might open the gateway to more drugs that are in the pipeline. There might not be one exact drug, but there might be others. And it might be a combination of everything you learned today. And there might be uh, other things that are in the pipeline tomorrow. So we want to thank them for sponsoring and also Asai also joining us as a sponsor. Once again, they sponsored this. Um, so that all of you could attend for free. And all of the people who are on the panels, moderating the panels, have donated uh, their time, their expertise, and their efforts to make this the best possible summit. So we're going to braid it on. We're going to start all talking right. to two people that are really instrumental uh, in our lives, who have been really at the forefront uh, of this disease. You know one very well. I do, Dr. Richard Isaacson from the Wheel Cornell Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic. Um, he's both uh, guided Maria and I on how to take care of our brains. Mm. Um, he is a bit of a nerd, uh, but that is lucky, uh, <laughs> and you'll see why. And he'll laugh at me for saying that. He will. Um, yeah, he's he a nerd. Cell phones. Uh, <laughs> he's not going to like that. He's also a new dad. So I'm going to talk to him about that. Also, Dr. Marie Bernard, you see her there. She's been a great friend to the women's Alzheimer's movement. She's at NIH. She has a big new title. Uh, she's leading the charge for diversity and she is going to uh, bring us up to date. Let me begin with you, Dr. Bernard. Thank you, first of all, so much for joining us. Thank you for your leadership at the NIH and thank you for everything you have done in this space. Tell me right now what you're excited about when it comes to brain health, Alzheimer's prevention, what's new, what's cutting edge? Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and yes, this is an exciting time. Um, uh, as you alluded to, a decade ago, we really didn't have much in the way of good news. Um, we didn't know a lot about the things that contribute to the development of this illness. Uh, we didn't thus know what you might uh, do that could be helpful to prevent it. And you certainly didn't have much in the way of uh, things that could be potential treatments. And that is very different now. Um, a decade ago, you a little bit more than a decade ago, you basically had to die and have an autopsy 
for to be sure that you have Alzheimer's disease. Now we have wonderful um, means of looking into the brain and seeing changes even before people have symptoms. Uh, we're beginning to find means of uh, checking for Alzheimer's from looking at spinal fluid or looking at blood or looking at other things. Uh, we are learning all sorts of things about the factors that can seem to be associated with the development of Alzheimer's and other dementias, just as you've been talking about. Uh, and yes, uh, the FDA approval last week of a new drug um, that targets amyloid that uh, gathers in the brain, um, that's a new development. And we're going to have to watch how things uh, go forward with that. Um, the FDA is calling for additional analyses, and it'll be very yeah. interesting to see how that all plays out. So it's an exciting time. Dr. Bernard, we've talked a lot about how Alzheimer's discriminates against women. Two thirds of those diagnosed with this disease are women and particularly discriminates against women of color. Uh, what are you doing there at NIH in terms of spreading the message about diversity, about pre-existing conditions, about getting this message out to communities of color in particular? So up until May 31st of this year, I was fully immersed in exactly that because I was the deputy director of the National Institute on Aging at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, my title now is uh, Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity for NIH as a whole. So in that capacity, I'm working on trying to make sure that there is a heterogeneity, a great variety of scientists who are pursuing these questions so that when you pull together a clinical study to evaluate a drug like the one that was just approved, uh, you're more likely to have a diverse population in which it was tested. Mm -hmm. And you can see whether there are differences based upon sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and those sorts of things. Uh, in my role at NIA, and as is continued by my colleagues, uh, it's very well appreciated that the way that Alzheimer's expresses itself it's going to vary by population. We've seen that there are differences in men and women. We're seeing that there are differences among African Americans and Blacks versus non-Hispanic whites and uh, potentially other populations. And so the team is working really hard to try to make sure that we recruit into clinical studies a wide variety of individuals so that we can get a full picture of the illness. If you only have a very narrow homogeneous group, everyone seeming the same, you're going to miss aspects of the illness and other ways of approaching the illness that would be very important. That's so critical, yeah, Lauren, because absolutely. for so long, we didn't even include women in any of these trials, much less communities of color. So also bringing researchers from different communities and they'll be looking at things from a different viewpoint and then also encouraging people uh, to join clinical trials. That's so important. so important. NIH needs people, uh, needs younger people now. That's also a big movement of asking people to, to uh, be a part of clinical trials, people of color, women, men, and also um, younger people. So we can look about how this disease progresses over time and what are the different factors that uh, affect certain populations, which yeah. is exciting. Yeah, so exciting. And, you know, and also exciting, we'll turn to Dr. Isaacson. Something that I've learned from you is that it was something I said earlier, which is that potentially four out of 10 cases of Alzheimer's may be preventable. Um, we're going to dive into these things as we go on throughout our day, but maybe you can give us an overview of prevention of brain health. How does someone get started? Sure. But I first have to say, you did call me a dork at the outside of this presentation <laughs> or a nerd, a nerd or something. No. Oh, I got these cool sunglasses. Am I any cooler now? <laughs> Don't, no, don't take no, them okay, off, okay. answer the question. Okay, sorry. So, um, okay, so having a sense of humor, first of all, is, is one good thing uh, to, to good. help brain and, and, and de-stress. So, so that was, that, there you go. Um, so four out of every 10 cases of Alzheimer's may be preventable if that person does everything right, because there are many cases out there that are based on and, and, and fast forwarded by something called modifiable risk factors. People that have high cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure, people that are not sleeping, are stressed out, um, aren't exercising, aren't eating healthful foods, 
all of these different things can have a really negative impact on the brain um, over time. Now, the good news is, is that lots of cases can be prevented and, and, and maybe not in everybody actually, in, in some cases and in many cases, we can't at this time anyway, definitively prevent Alzheimer's. But I think in everyone, we can make brain healthy choices today, like you said, Lauren, to have a positive impact tomorrow. Um, exercise on a regular basis, eating a Mediterranean style diet, um, making a plan for sleep. Um, you know, seven hours, seven and a half hours, as a minimum, these five and six hour things, we, we can't do it. We have to prioritize that. Um, learning about brain health is critical. And I know both Women's Alzheimer's Movement and HFC have done tremendous, um, uh, you know, pushes forward to educate the public about brain health. Um, uh, uh, one more thing, I want to say that everyone needs to know their numbers. Everyone needs to see their physicians on a regular basis. Even if your physician may not be aware of the latest and greatest in brain science, and you're going to hear from amazing experts today who, who certainly are aware, knowing your own personal numbers, everyone should know their weight, their waist circumference, their blood pressure, their cholesterol. These are all things that can slam the brakes on the progress and the fast forwarding of Alzheimer's. And we need to do that. Women, two out of three brains affected by Alzheimer's are women. We used to say we don't know why until I met Maria Shriver about five, six, seven years ago. And she elbowed me on the set of some media thing and said, Isaacson, go find out, go figure it out. And now I think we understand more and you can learn about that today because women, unfortunately, may be sitting in the fast lane when men may be sitting in traffic and there are things we can do, perimenopause transitions, specific risk factors related to women. We really need to identify these things and intervene. Um, I'm really hopeful because while we don't have a one size fits all approach to, to reducing risk for Alzheimer's and prevention, every single person out there today can make a change. And I really hope everyone feels empowered to do that. Definitely. And, 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 and I guess something that I think that everyone should really hear is when should someone start on their brain health journey? Is it ever too late? So I don't think it's ever too late. Um, you know, when we first started the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic uh, eight years ago, it was something that was, you know, what is, how do you, Alzheimer's prevention? Like, how do you even put those words in the same sentence? Alzheimer's disease begins in the brain over 20 to 30 years before the first symptom of memory loss begins. And that leaves a lot of time to make these brain healthy choices. Um, what we do in our program is we basically ask um, when, when the family members first started having uh, the very first change or symptom of Alzheimer's, we then basically um, subtract 25 years or so. And that's about when people, I would say at a minimum should start. We initially started seeing people 40 and above, then we reduce the age to 30 above and, and honestly about probably probably 20s 25 and above honestly even people in in grade school and in high school and college wearing a helmet while riding a bike not smoking these are things um, that just really can have a positive impact on the brain and those things need to start even younger so I would say anytime our research has shown that um, you know uh, there's a cutoff about about the age of 61 uh, people below the age of 61 did better in terms of cognitive outcomes when they followed this uh, this uh, kind of tailored plan but people above the age of 61 still responded it just took a little bit longer um, to to get there so I think anyone uh, at any age can do this I think it's really important if you're 62, 63, 64, 65, don't freak out. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think embark on this journey today. I think there's a lot of um, fear, in, particularly in the boomer population, 10,000 people turning 65 every single day worried like it's too late. It's not. Everything we're telling you today, you can start today. And that's why we have these breakout sessions. That's why we focused them. I think as Richard was saying, you know, particularly for women, we're gonna have one on women and hormones. We're gonna talk about nutrition. Richard has written an Alzheimer's prevention book. There's a lot of data now on nutrition, exercise. Every doctor I've spoken to said, if you could tell people one thing, exercise, 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 right? Diet, women, as, as, as you just said, hormones in particular. And meditation, meditation, you were saying that's hard for you. If I can meditate, anybody can meditate. I mean, I would love to see this, honestly, because she's always going. Wouldn't that be incredible? Yes, you, you'd have to come over about 6 a.m. And I'll, I'll give you, you know, if you donate a lot of money, somebody come over and watch me. My foot does tap, but then it slows down. But those are our sessions today. They're moderated, uh, as we said, as you saw at the top of the hour with really interesting people. And so how are you going to go to these sessions? You're going to scroll down and you're going to find your session.
session, right? And then you're going to press the button and you're going to go off and you're going to find the session that speaks to you that you want to hear more about. And then you're going to stay there for about 30 minutes. Then you're going to come back here with us and we're going to talk to the moderators of those sessions, what they found out, what they learned, what surprised them, what intrigued them. And so we're going to all kind of come together and then we're going to go on to our after party. So find the session that speaks to you that you are interested in. Go there, take notes. I'm a big believer in taking notes. Uh, Take notes so you can remember what uh, Marie said, what um, Richard said, and what you learn in these sessions. Because the whole point of today is to educate you, enlighten you, inspire you, and ignite you to actually get going. It's not too late. If you're my age, her age, it doesn't matter. Just get going. So find your session and go. I think first, are we doing a video? Oh, do we have a video I first? A, I think we have a, a video from my adorable husband first, actually, I believe. Um, and then we're going. Okay, because Sandy told me we're going now. Oh, sorry. So, but we're, maybe I we'll go to wrong. Seth now. So where should we go, Sandy? Should we go to Seth or should yeah. we? We'll go to Seth. So let's go to Seth because okay. he'll make us laugh and then we'll go to the sessions. <laughs> Seth, where are you? <laughs> Hi there, I'm Seth Rogen. I'm very sorry I can't be with you live today. I'm currently on set filming a TV show. Uh, I hope you are enjoying Brain It On. After hearing from experts like Dr. Isaacson, Lauren and I started taking steps to protect our own brains a few years ago. We've incorporated HFC's five brain health habits into our daily lives. We have a great sleep routine that includes us going to bed at the same time each night and keeping our room very cold. We learned to make pottery, which makes us happy and calm, and we are learning to make glazes, which challenges our brains. We found exercises we both enjoy, like hiking and HIT training, and we eat healthy foods like vegetables and salmon, even though we don't love that. These are easy to do and important because science tells us that four in 10 cases of Alzheimer's may be preventable. Today's event will help you start your own brain health journey. In a minute, you can join one of four breakout sessions focusing on nutrition, exercise, the power of mindfulness, and what women need to know about their brains. Each breakout session is filled with a great mix of doctors, scientists, experts, and also celebs like Rocco Despirito, Liz Hernandez, Julianne Huff, Apollo Ono, and more. So enjoy the breakouts, and when the event is over, you'll be ready to start your own brain health journey. And now, back to you, Lauren and Maria. (laughs) <laughs> even if you don't like salmon you're eating it right we are well and I, I like salmon luckily but but there are definitely I, you know it's the salad for me and I really have to try but I do it but green leafy vegetables not my favorite but they're important so I like my vegetable good. salmon I have tried in every incarnation <laughs> cannot get it together but uh, I keep trying okay so now you're going to go to that orange join now button and you're going to go to the session that you signed up for or that you're interested in, whatever you want to do. They're all great. They're all interesting. And then we'll come back here and talk with all the moderators of those sessions. So you'll be able to hear what happened in the session that you didn't go to. So there you go. The breakout sessions are beginning now. Go to the orange join now button that is next to your choice and press it. And boom, I guess you'll go in there. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. And thanks to our hosts, Maria Shriver and Lauren Miller for their wonderful introductions and uh, for creating HFC and women's Alzheimer's uh, movement. Obviously, uh, brain health is top of mind, no pun intended, for many people these days. Uh, And uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, Dr. Annie Fenn and Dr. Aisha Shirzai, who are here live with us right now. And uh, we'll be, we've had a robust conversation about foods that are delicious and brain healthy. So I hope we continue. We were just talking about uh, wild forged morel and mayatake mushrooms, two of my <laughs> favorites. Uh, and apparently you guys have these in your backyard. I'm a little jealous because living <laughs> in New York City certainly has its perks, but we don't have morels in our backyard. How are you guys doing? Good. Very well. Wonderful. Thanks for having yeah. me. This Thank is so you so fun. much for having me, Rocco. 
Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, I, I know that you're in Wyoming and California where there's an abundance of fresh, local, wonderful ingredients. Uh, before I start taking questions, I just love to know as a chef who's collaborated with many, many uh, doctors and functional medicine physicians and uh, health experts over the years, or over the course of writing 10 plus books on the subject, uh, what are three foods that people should add to their diets today at the end of this session to improve brain health? So, uh, so I, I guess I'll take the I'll take yeah, the question. Dr. Uh, yeah, take yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, as as a physician and as a researcher, someone who actually sees patients in the clinic and in the hospital, um, and I, I treat Alzheimer's disease, and I also do research in the community. It's very important for us, and we were talking about this earlier, that we focus on very easy things that people can do every single day. So, whether it's in uh, in the clinic or in the research, you know, we highlight foods that are very important for the brain. Um, the, you know, I personally try to shy away from the concept of superfood. You know, we don't eat one food at a time, we eat different types of food, but then certain foods stand out. You know, things like green leafy vegetables, they're superb foods. And there've been research that showed that when people actually eat green leafy vegetables on a regular basis, they have younger looking brains and their function of the brain is better too. Things like blueberries or any berries for that matter. Spices, pound for pound, they have more anti-inflammatory and antioxidant foods for the brain. We have a concept called the Neuro 9, the nine foods to eat. So green leafy vegetables, berries, uh, whole grains like oats and quinoa, which is a pseudo grain, C uh, seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, nuts like walnuts and hazelnuts, uh, berries, tea, uh, cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli. If people add these to their foods every day, not necessarily all of them, but if they can highlight some of the foods on a regular basis, their brain will actually function better. They're going to be able to prevent cognitive decline, not just Alzheimer's disease, but cognitive decline, which is a state where, you know, we start having cognitive decline in our 20s and 30s. So every step of change, every time we eat better foods, we actually prevent that from happening and we live a long, cognitively vibrant life. Yes, I asked I, for I, three. I would totally you agree. gave me a doctor. I just wanted to add that Dr. Shusai is a neurologist and the co-director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at uh, Yoma Linda University, where she leads the lifestyle program for the prevention of neurological diseases. And uh, Dr. Annie Fenn, also a physician chef and culinary instructor, focused on cultivating lifelong brain health with evidence-based food and lifestyle interventions. She's about to publish her first book. I'm, I think I sh should have kept that a secret. I won't, I won't tell anyone that I may have heard the name by accident, uh, but thank you both for joining us. Sorry, I forgot to introduce you earlier. No uh, Dr. Fenn, what say you about the subject? Yeah. That's okay. Um, I agree, Aisha and I are both physicians. Um, we're both very science-based when it comes to nutrition. When I was coming up in residency in medical school, nutrition wasn't such a hard science as it has become. And honestly, when I was practicing obstetrics and gynecology for over 20 years, um, we knew a lot about how to prevent heart disease with food, but we didn't know so much how to prevent brain problems with food, like age-related cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. But since around you know, 2000, 2015, um, there's been this huge mountain of data that shows us that what you eat really does either slow down the aging of your brain or accelerate it. And so in 2015, I decided to focus on this exclusively to teach people how to eat better and to cook with neuroprotective foods. So that's why I started the Brain Health Kitchen Cooking School. Um, so I've been doing that since 2015. And since then, the data has grown even stronger. And what we're realizing is that the more the closer you are to a plant-based diet, the more likely you are to age well with a thriving brain, a better memory, and you also have better brain function now. So what Aisha was talking about with the leafy greens, the berries, the cruciferous vegetables, the nuts and seeds, all of those things are super important. They should be the foundation of your diet. And the thing I usually recommend for people to do first is to attack the snack cupboard in their home. <laughs> like I'm a huge believer in the yes. environment. Let's, let's talk about that, yeah. Yeah, because the food environment the intervention in your, home, time in your car, people. in your office is basically what you end up eating because you know if you wanna eat brain healthy, you have to make the brain healthy choice the easy choice. And your journey for brain health is gonna start in your kitchen really because you are going to want to cook some of your own food and not rely on outside sources for it. 
So I tell people first thing to do, my snack cupboard is right here. It used to be when my kids were little, it was filled with all sorts of stuff I don't even want to talk about, like chips and crackers and, you know, packaged sweets and things like that. You get rid of all of the packaged goods, the processed foods, the foods with refined sugar, the foods with refined carbohydrates, like all purpose white flour, the things with any ingredients that sound like chemicals or that you can't pronounce. Get rid of all of those foods and replace it with nuts and pumpkin seeds and dates and figs and dark chocolate. And, you know, you can take a date and open it up and fill it with almond butter. And you've got a nutritious snack that's full of fiber. That's more delicious than anything you can get from a box or a bag. So I would say first approach is your snack cupboard. Absolutely. Yeah. So not only adding these foods, the nine foods that Dr. Shazai mentioned, but getting rid of some of these foods. And uh, I had a hard break with these foods about 15 years ago. Uh, it also, uh, I coupled it with tri triathlons and Ironman. So it was easy for me to do at the time. Not that there's anything easy about Ironman, but when you're, when you're training for something that intense, you need every advantage that you can give yourself. And the same thing is true for life, right? When we're training to become older and stay healthy, it's sort of like training for a, a marathon or a triathlon. You know, this is a, this is a uh, long race. We need to stay healthy for the long term. And breaking up with sugar and all the snack foods that contain the chemicals and the unpronounceable uh, foods that we, sh we should avoid is hard, but it's only hard for about a month, I found. What, what do you guys, uh, as physicians who recommend this to your patients every day, what have you found in the research about the time it takes to break up with these or end these toxic relationships with food and people sometimes, but let's just focus on food for now. Yeah, it's, it's so important. Dr. To create, yeah. yeah, It's so important to create healthy habits. You're absolutely right, Rocco. I think, um, and you, we were talking about this earlier, as far as information of what kind of foods or dietary patterns are important for brain health, I think we have enough information. You know, having seen wonderful data come from Columbia University as far as Mediterranean dietary pattern is concerned, or the MIND diet, which comes from Rush University, or the, um, you know, the dietary information that comes from other uh, populations, whether it's the California teacher study, Northern Manhattan study in Columbia, where I trained, there is it's essentially a variation of the same theme, more plant-based, less processed and less saturated fats. That's basically, if I had to summarize the information about uh, brain health, foods are concerned, that's basically it. And focusing on creating good habits should be the first step. You can't get to that optimal uh, position or that point all of a sudden. We always say, you didn't get here overnight, you're not gonna get out of it overnight and understanding your palate, your taste pattern is so important. When I was training as a fellow at Columbia University, I realized that I was giving people more recipes during my en encounter with them than aspirin or a cholesterol medication because it's about long-term health. So, you know, having been through cooking school and having worked with people in the behavioral neurology side of things, it's identifying your good points and strengths and identifying your weaknesses. So say, for example, a lot of people have a sweet tooth. They like to have a little bit of candy, some dessert, you know, sugary dessert at the end of the day. How do we create a program where they don't, where they're not drawn to it? So it's not about deprivation. It's not about saying, oh, I'm not going to ever eat that anymore. It's about replacing it with something else. So for example, if people love their candy bars, replacing them with beautiful truffles that they can make with dates, walnuts, and cocoa powder, for example, or making beautiful recipes out of cashews with berries and nuts and seeds, instead of saying, I'm not going to have any dessert anymore. So it's all about replacement instead of depriving yourself. Food should never be about depriving yourself. Health should never be about depriving yourself. And food is more than just food. It's who we are. It's our memories. It's our culture. It's our stories and traditions. And to celebrate it in a healthy way, that's what we're all trying to do. And that's what Annie's trying to do too. And I agree. And I also am someone who has, was, I, I feel like I was born with a sweet tooth and I blame it on my Sicilian relatives. But honestly, a lot of people have a sweet tooth and that's not really an excuse for me to just eat <laughs> sugar all the time. So somewhere around the age of, I don't know, 35, I decided that I couldn't do that anymore. It wasn't healthy. The data was starting to build that all this sugar is really bad for our bodies and our brains. And so, you know, one of the things that I did that worked for me is I would never buy a packaged sweet, like a packaged cookie or a packaged cake 
Um, those things are full of the types of foods that we don't want you guys to eat. Yeah. Um, so if I want to make something that's a treat, I make it myself in my own kitchen and I make sure that I'm using natural sugars, which is sort of a euphemism. But what I mean is like whole food forms of sugar, like honey or dates, things like that. And also lots of fiber. If you have a treat that's full of fiber, it's mm -hmm. going to slow down the absorption of the sugar. Mm -hmm. And there's direct correlation between how your blood sugar spikes and over time, how much time your insulin spikes and the metabolism of your brain and how it ages. So we want to keep you with a fiber rich diet. Fiber is totally your friend when it comes to these foods. You don't have to give up desserts at all. Um, you just have to make sure that you're choosing the right ingredients. And my rule is I cook them at home. Yeah. Or Aisha has some great. Doctors, you've, you've, <laughs> you've, covered, you've covered so many topics that I talk about every day with my clients and in my books. Uh, let, let's bring up the topic of sugar. Are there sugars that you're okay with? So you mentioned honey. How is coconut nectar on the list for you? Where does that rank uh, raw organic coconut nectar, for example, as a replacement for co conventional sugar? Like coconut palm sugar? The or coconut one? nectar. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, the syrup that comes from the blossom yeah. of the coconut flower that oh, okay. you can buy I now. I don't use that. Do you use it, Aisha? No. So, um, you know, sugar is sugar um, mm -hmm. and it has many different names. But if it's, uh, you know, if it's coconut sugar, if it's palm sugar, if it's Tasmanian sugar, sugar is sugar, unfortunately. I've lost friends based on this sentence. But, <laughs> you know, honestly, um, the, the, the most important thing is eating foods or eating sweeteners that don't really create a spike in your glucose levels and don't, you know, put your body into a frenzy so that it starts insulin secretion. And almost all of the sugar sources, even if they're called natural, uh, they actually do that. Honey does that. Agave syrup does that. Maple, mm. do, maple syrup does that to a certain extent, not as much. It's slower, the, the incline in, uh, in glucose levels. So I guess, you know, if we really want to stay away from sugar, one word that I absolutely hate is moderation. What does that even mean? Moderation for someone who is eating five chocolate bars is, you know, not eating four chocolate bars a day versus someone who eats only one. So, you know, getting rid of all of them is ideal. I know it's difficult, but understanding that all of them act essentially the same way. Um, the, the kind of sugars that are good for us are the ones that are bound with fiber. Annie was saying fiber is so important and she's absolutely right. Fiber yeah. essentially keeps the sugar in our gut and doesn't allow it to be released quickly. It's that quick release of sugar from our gut that causes most problems. So fruits, for example, are amazing. They're bound with, fr uh, with fiber and the sugars come with so many other micronutrients and vitamins too. Dates are great too because it has a ton of fiber. Um, and the other artificial sweeteners, one of one, someone actually asked about artificial sweeteners, you know, uh, things like monk fruit sweetener is actually really good, you know, pound for pound, it has the same kind of sweetness, you can use it in dessert, you can use it in your, um, in your beverages. I personally don't like stevia, because of the bitter aftertaste, but it can be good for some people too. <laughs> and there's some other sugar alcohols like erythritol, xylitol, um, they're, they're great. Some people have some gut issues with them, it causes bloating and GI disturbances. But all in all, <coughs> Those sugars, the monk fruit and the alcohol sugars, they don't release uh, sugar into your into your body, and your body doesn't go into that state of shock. So that <coughs> of it. so those are great. Yeah, and one thing that's Dr. Really Shazai, I'm glad you mentioned uh, some of the alternatives. I'm sorry, Dr. Kevin. Just a second. I've had uh, tremendous success personally with clients using monk fruit, monk fruit juice, uh, and uh, stevia. And although stevia does have a little bit of a, of a strong sting uh, in the aftertaste. Those are, these are both natural sweeteners that come from a natural source. They are not imitation uh, sweeteners. They're not chemically produced in a lab. They both come from plants. Uh, you know, monk fruit is a melon when it starts out in life and, and stevia is an herb when it starts out in life. And you can actually grow the herb stevia and put that in your iced tea yes. if you'd like to. So I'm so glad that we all agree on this topic. I, there's a lot of confusion. And uh, another way I've, I've found to add fiber to your diet is to use psyllium husk powder. I put it in my shake every day. I try to consume about 40 to 50 grams of fiber a day, both in my fruits and vegetables and, and whole foods and as a supplement. How do you guys feel about supplementing with something like psyllium husk powder to make sure that you're ingesting enough fiber? 
Tiny? You know, I try to get fiber through um, the beans and the vegetables and the berries and all the other things in my diet, but I'm sure I fall short a lot of the time. So um, I like to use psyllium, not so much as a supplement, but I use, like to use it in my baking. Um, like I use flax seeds that are ground up because yes. if you're using gluten-free yes, it's flours, a wonderful ingredient. Yeah. Like I like to bake with a lot yes. of nutrient dense flours, like almond flour and hazelnut flour, um, buckwheat flour. And sometimes these gluten-free flours require a little bit more um, structure. So I like to use it that way. So, so Dr. Fenn, safe to say you also avoid gluten, both for your dietary preferences and probably for brain health. Can, can we talk no, no, I don't a little avoid bit about that? For brain health. I, um, I think that it's perfectly fine okay. to consume gluten as long as you're not gluten sensitive, mm -hmm. gluten allergic, or have celiac disease, which is really less than three or 4% of the population. Yeah. Um, there's lots of very nutrient dense gluten foods, like, um, like some of the wheat products are actually quite good for you. Yeah. Um, but I do like to mess around with a lot of the gluten-free flours Example, because they can be more nutrient dense. And it also improves it also increases the diversity of basically the plant foods in your diet. If you're not always reaching for wheat. Dr. Shazai, we're getting lots of questions. I'm just going to hit you with a few. Should we focus on buying organic foods? I think it, you know how I feel about that, but uh, please, please feel free to respond. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I work, I work with uh, communities who are not, um, who don't have some resources, who may not be, you know, at a socioeconomic state where they can afford to get uh, organic foods. And I work in places where there are a lot of food deserts and with individuals who can't really, you know, have uh, have that at all. So, you know, as far as organic foods are concerned, of course, they're better uh, than conventional foods. Um, there is some research that is continuously being done and we're understanding more and more the impact of chemicals and pesticides on brain health. But at the end of the day, if people eat vegetables, that's more important than eating organic or not eating organic. So what I say is just eat vegetables. If you can afford organic, that's great. But if you can't, even conventional vegetables are important to consume. All you have to do is spend probably a little more time to wash them very well. And washing, washing them, them yes. uh, soaking them can actually get rid of a lot of the pesticides. And it's an area that we're uh, actually learning more and more about the type of pesticides and how it affects brain health. Dr. Fenn, here's a question from Sharon. What about the science that shows the benefit of a keto diet on brain health? Well, you know, there's some things about the keto diet that are really interesting for brain health. Like there's a lot of study on fasting, whether you do it intermittently or part of your religion and how that might change the way your brain ages, um, might help you reach an optimal weight. So I like the fasting component in some ways if it's, if it's done very carefully. Um, what I don't like about the keto diet, the way most people follow it, is that it includes a lot of foods that are very high in saturated fat. Mm -hmm. And we know that the brain healthy diet is low in saturated fat. We have studies that show this, that you wanna keep your saturated fat under 5% of total in your diet. You wanna eat mostly monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, like the omega-3 fatty acids. So and my problem with keto is mostly it's, it's too restricting. It also eliminates a lot of the food groups that I really want people to eat like whole grains and legumes and things like that. I'm not saying go eat a bunch of refined carbs because we don't want you to do that either, but um, I want people to have a wide diversity of food um, because of that whole gut microbiome link with the brain. So if people can do keto quite smart. I've seen that, but I'm concerned about the way I see, I see a lot of people do it. And we don't have studies, do we, Aisha, that shows it prevents Alzheimer's. I was actually going to add to that because it's important for, for, the, for these lovely people who have joined us and are spending time to understand that we don't have good objective evidence that ketogenic diet can actually slow down cognitive decline. The studies that are coming to us, they're very small and they've been done for a very short period of time. And you can't really apply that into the populations. They were poor quality. People weren't able to maintain, um, you know, ketosis for a long uh, time. And it was done in people who had advanced Alzheimer's disease. So you can't really apply that into the general population of healthy individuals. And like Annie was saying, it's important to eat a wholesome, unprocessed diet with lots of fiber and ketogenic diet 
probably might be good short term for losing weight, but long term it damages the arteries in our brain, which are so important for getting oxygen and nutrition for the very, very sensitive and important parts of our brain that are responsible for memory, for judgment, for decision making, and just living a long life. So it's not consistent with it. So what are some of the fats that you would recommend people use in a uh, plant-based diet? Um, olive oil is, is an obvious one. Are there others that you guys like that you uh, recommend to your clients? Yeah, I also like avocado oil. I use olive oil as my primary cooking oil based on the Mediterranean yeah. diet studies, based on the MIND diet study and the one that's coming out soon. Um, olive oil is full of monounsaturated fatty acids. Um, it's very low in saturated fat. If it also has polyphenols and polyphenols are the active ingredients in plants that actually block oxidative stress in the brain. And we're starting to see some studies on people who actually have very, very early cognitive decline and how do their brains react to being supplemented with olive oil in their diet. So it's very interesting. Um, I got rid of, when I talked to my students in the cooking school about cleaning out their pantries, the first thing we actually do is clean out the cupboard where you keep your oils. We get rid of all of the, the seed oils, all the highly processed oils, all the heat processed oils. So replacing that with extra virgin olive oil plus avocado oil. And another oil I like a lot is pecan oil because it is high in monounsaturated fats and also, also has polyphenols. How do you feel about grapeseed oil? I don't use grapeseed oil a lot. Na natural organic high, grapeseed oil. Yeah, yeah I, it has a high smoke point. So I use avocado oil instead. You have to cook with olive, olive oil fairly gently, but avocado oil has a higher smoke point. So that's replaced all the grapeseed oil in my pantry. And grapeseed's pretty high in omega-6 fatty acids, the more inflammatory ones. So I don't use it at all. Got it. Uh, there's, a, there's a question from Melinda Cooper. No time to cook. Any good, quote, pre-made meals? I buy a lot of Amy's brand. Dr. Shazai, perhaps you have some? Thoughts? I would say, um, I well, there are some really good ones out there, but I think it would be better. I know this is like a little too much pressure on you, but I think it's better to learn a couple of really quick recipes that you can make at home. One of the pillars of brain health uh, that we mentioned in our book, The 30 Day Alzheimer's Solution was eat home cooked meals. And it's not difficult at all, especially if you pre plan and prep, you know, have a pot of chickpeas or have a pot of quinoa that keeps really well in your refrigerator for a long time, have some greens, make two uh, or maybe one dressing, and you can have, you know, a minute and five, a meal in five minutes. So um, do that. I wouldn't really I, I don't I don't have the time or I actually don't know much about brands that are actually good and are uh, well prepared. But, you know, if you have no time whatsoever, a can of chickpeas with some greens and a little bit of lemon and extra virgin olive oil is the way to go. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I was just going to say a handful of berries is always a great solution for uh, uh, a quick snack, even Absolutely. even part of a meal. Start Absolutely. your meal with a handful of berries. And uh, if you have a if you have a farmer's market nearby, which which uh, happens to, to be the case for many, many more people now than 10, 15 years ago, even in big cities, even in cities with the food deserts, there are farmer's markets, uh, you know, accessible through public transportation. So even in the worst case scenario, you can get to those. You know, you're, you're talking about something that's grown locally, pesticide free, and that's the best of all worlds. When something's grown locally, you know, the nutrition density is much higher. It's not traveled thousands of miles to get to you. It's not as old. And so all the nutritional uh, ingredient, you know, all the nutrition that you're looking for and benefit from are still in the food. Sometimes when you buy food that comes from a long way away, like, like a country, another country that's 5,000 miles away, you're, uh, you know, you're eating these foods and making the effort, but you're doing it in vain. I'm not saying eat a chocolate bar instead, but uh, try to get something local if you can. Uh, I just noticed that in New York, there are about 10 new farmers markets uh, all through the five boroughs. So if you're in uh, on the East Coast, there's good news for you. Of course, if you're on the West Coast uh, in California, there's farmers markets everywhere. Uh, there's a question from uh, Azramad. We try to have salmon two to three times a week. I, I hear you. We love salmon. We try sockeye, which is uh, often wild and uh, doesn't taste as good. Recipes for salmon, I guess, is what he's after doctors, what, what, uh, what do you have in mind? Well, I can probably speak to that. Um, you know, I would, I would prefer for people to seek out wild salmon if they can, 
It's more mm -hmm. sustainably harvested and also has healthier fat profile than the farm salmon. If you go to a restaurant, I'd be willing to bet it's going to be a farm salmon unless it says on the menu that it's not because wild salmon is a little bit more expensive. You don't need to eat salmon every day or fish every day. You can get all the DHA your brain needs with one serving of high quality fish or seafood a day. I mean, per week, one, one serving per week. So you don't need to go crazy, you know, eating salmon every other night. It gets expensive. Um, and it's also these fish are very precious. So I would choose wild salmon. I would seek out um, a source where you know it's reliable, where you know it's actually not farmed. And I like to cook it very low heat. That means either on the grill with indirect heat, never over direct heat, or in the oven, I literally put my oven at 300 degrees and I put the salmon in there for 20 to 30 minutes. Because um, what, if you cook too much, the vitamin D in the salmon seeps out and mm -hmm. so do those brain healthy omega-3 fatty acids. So you wanna cook it in a way to preserve those really good brain healthy fats. Hi Rocco, hey. we're gonna have to wrap up shortly. Okay, yeah, I saw that, yeah, yeah. No problem, uh, I, there's some it's questions about forever. coconut oil, I'm a big fan and uh, smoked salmon. Uh, Dr. Fenn, do you, do you think smoked salmon is uh, an okay substitute for I think it's fresh fine, salmon? But the smoking, smoking techniques differ. I prefer a cold smoked method if you can seek yes. it out and it should be wild caught salmon. It will say on the package, you have to look for that. Um, the high heat smoke method sometimes can have some inflammatory particles in the food that you don't want to eat all the time. Every once in a while, of course, it's okay. And Dr. Shusai, how do you feel about coconut oil? Raw, organic, of course, not the processed stuff. I'm sorry to say, but coconut oil is, it has a lot of saturated fats, as much saturated fat as, you know, beef tallow and butter. Um, and unfortunately, as delicious as it is, I love coconut oil, but it's not very healthy for our arteries. And I wanted to answer Janet's question too. She's a vegetarian and she says salmon is not an option. So Janet, you know, a diet can be healthy with or without fish. As a matter of fact, you know, we have uh, the, the book right there, the 30 day Alzheimer's solution. And you know, all of my recipes are, are plant based. So you can actually eat a very healthful plant based, hopeful plant based diet. And also which also, you know, benefits the brain. And we have a lot of data for it supporting that concept. Thank you. And Janet, I wrote a book called Rocco's Healthy and Delicious 200 plant based recipes that I think will also fall squarely in the uh, parameters that Dr. Shazai is talking about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all of your questions. There's another three dozen. I, I wish we had the time to get to them. We're all uh, we're, we're all looking forward to seeing the, uh, what's going on in the breakout room. So please join us there. Thank you, Dr. Fenn, Dr. Shazai, and of course, uh, HFC and the Women's Alzheimer Movement uh, for having all of us. We hope to talk to you again soon and uh, see you in the breakout room. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you for Good joining. Day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rocco. Annie, see pleasure, you later. Everybody. Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. So we have some good news and some bad news. All right. The good news is too many people showed up. And uh -huh. the bad news is that they didn't get included in the breakout sessions but then there's now more good news so first of all let's say we're sorry about that very uh, sorry about that very sorry we're like really really sorry <laughs> but the good news is we're going to get every session for you we're going to email you all the sessions we're going to post it on the websites but you are going to get a full download of everything that happened so you don't miss anything all four sessions coming directly to you um, so you didn't see it in real time but you're going to see it and we apologize for that, but it just tells us that everybody wants to find out about these four areas and they want to go on a brain health journey. So we're excited about that, but bummed that everybody couldn't get in. Yeah. But we, we have the appreciate the patients and yeah. we, you know, have our amazing moderators joining us. That's right. We do because they're going to tell us what happened in their sessions and they had to handle people not being able to get in. So bravo yeah. to all four of them. And we're so happy they're all joining us. We were able to listen in. We did listen in. Yes. And, and, and heard some good stuff. Um, and I feel like there was a lot of really good, useful information shared. That was the whole point. So we want to welcome back Juliana Ho. We want to recommend Rocco Spirito, Liz Hernandez, and Malika Chopra, and all of them are experts in their space. So Julianne, let me start with you, uh, because everybody knows you from Dancing with the Stars, and you've also just started a whole new company, and you're really into 
brain health and exercise. What surprised you about your session? First of all, thank you so much for doing it. And But what surprised you? Well, thank you for having me. And yes, that's exactly what I'm passionate about. The, the holistic approach of how we move our body and how that directly affects our brain health and the building of new connectors. So we had an incredible panel of Dr. Wendy Suzuki, uh, a neuroscientist. We had Jen Zients, who focuses on the cognitive fitness and the cognitive health. And then, of course, Apollo Ono, um, you know, the most decorated U.S. Olympia, winter Olympian, uh, speed skater, and also my Dancing with the Stars partner. Um, and and it was just an incredible conversation of learning about neuroplasticity and how we can build new connectors in our brain, the, the, the function of movement, our positive thinking, um, our emotions, and how that really affects uh, the new growth cells. And then, of course, we had this really beautiful, immersive uh, breakout at the very end that Dr. Wendy Suzuki led us through, where she got us up all on our feet. We were saying positive affirmations while moving our body. And it was just amazing to watch this neuroscientist who is just living her best life, having so much fun and showing us what is possible. You know, we can we can be very thoughtful and conscious about how we're uh, dedicating our, um, you know, our, our function to help our brain. But it doesn't mean that it has to be boring or hard. It can be really yeah. fun. And in fact, the more emotion, the more excitement, the more creativity that we create, it helps build those new brain cells. So it was just beautiful and amazing. And thank you for letting me be a part of this and share. Oh, are you, um, and I are love you kidding? We're so that. happy because you're just such an inspiration to so many people. I watch you and I'm like, I, in my dreams, in my wildest <laughs> dreams, could I move like you? But I know you've really been, I think, you know, involved in this space, trying to urge people that it's not just about moving your body, but what that does to your brain, to your mood. And you've been talking to researchers and scientists and you have a new company called Kinergy. But did you see, hear anything in there today that made you step back and go, wow, I hadn't thought about that. I didn't know about that. You know, I think one of the things that I recognize in my life was that that dance has been a superpower. And I started very early on, and a lot of people can be intimidated by the fact that, well, I haven't found my superpower yet. And the superpower is that we have this anomaly, this brain inside of our head. Yeah. And that is that is the extraordinary thing. And so we all have a superpower. It's just about how we use it and and how we we actually focus on our our creativity and how we have innovative conversations, because, you know, after this last year, this is what what uh, Jen Zients talked about was over this last year, it's been super challenging and we've got into a comfort zone of not being innovative with our thoughts because we've been home mm. and done what's comfortable. So now coming out into the world again and being creative in how we have conversations, I said, I feel like I have no personality. I don't know how to have a conversation anymore. <laughs> and, and, and then she recognized, she was like, no, but this is where we actually grow is by thinking and being creative of how we communicate with people and that our creativity comes alive. And instead of being surface level, how do we get deeper? How do we have deeper conversations to connect with individuals? And that's going to actually help our brain function. And you don't think about yeah. like interaction and relational um, when you think of building new brain cells, but that's what life is about. It's about creating memories and experiences with people and getting to know each other and, you know, feeling those emotions. And that's what builds our new, you know, it's like a bubble bath, you know, getting these new connectors in our brain. And um, I just thought that that was really fascinating. It's about relational connection. I love that. I love that too. Yes. I love that. And, and, and it, you know, it's, about what works for you. I think what you said about your superpower and finding your own strength. And, you know, I think back a couple of years ago and I hadn't moved my body in a long time and I was like, oh, exercise, no way. And I had to dig deep and find, like you said, in a way, my, my superpower, and I'm not a dancer by any means, but I move my body in a way that works for me. And, and yes. it gives me energy. It really does make me happy. And I thought that that was a myth. Well, I, I, I think crazy. what she also does, which is so great, is she makes it look fun. 
yeah. and it, it, inviting. You totally. you you inspire us to get up and move. Yeah. Like the way <laughs> your attitude about it. So that's a, a such a positive thing because having fun being excited, doing it with somebody else. That's part of it too. You're not going to do it if you're like, oh God, I got to run no, again. Totally. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's actually, that's what Kinergy is. Then my new company, it's, it's, yeah. we're trying to shift the way that we look at fitness as this external thing, but it's this internal energetic expression. It's not about perfection. It's about expression. You move your body the way your body was designed to move. And so Lauren, I love that you said that because it's not about what you look like. It's about how you feel. And when you feel amazing, your belief systems change. And when your belief systems change, your actions change. And then your whole life changes. <laughs> um, wow. So, yeah. So I thank you for saying that. And again, thank you for having me. This is just, I'm so passionate about life. And this is life giving. <laughs> thank you. That's so great. Julian Huff, that Thank is you. just such an inspiration, such a, a leader in this space. And I've uh, seen her and we're so glad that you joined us. And I want to hear more about Kinergy and watch it grow and be involved and help you guys out. And uh, so that exercise is such a big part of the brain health journey. So such we're so yes. great that she joined us. Now, Rocco. Yes. Another, yes. Another Hi. Part, of course. Nutrition. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We popped in a little bit. Uh, we heard a, a bit about the discussion about sugar, um, yeah. which of course we want to hear a bit more about, but I know that you have a real passion for making things that are delicious synonymous with also being healthy. Um, when did, did brain health, when did cooking healthy and delicious uh, become a part of your life? Thank you for putting it that way. That's, that's uh, something I've been saying for a long time but uh, healthy and delicious are not mutually exclusive. I really appreciate being here with you guys, uh, Maria and Lauren, and of course, all the other uh, panel leaders. Uh, and I, of course, I was uh, lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Annie Fan and Dr. Yeah. Aisha Shirzai, who are neurologists and uh, you know brain-focused physicians who've written and are in the process of writing uh, books on the subject and I had tremendous amount of knowledge. And what was wonderful to hear, and, and so, many of, so much of what they had to say was, confirmation that a lot of the things we've been hearing for about 10 years, I, I would say that the last 10 years was um, a, a very special time for very high quality information and research. The previous 20 to 30 years, lots of research, not sure it was very high quality. Uh, and in the last, last 10 years, we've certainly confirmed that uh, a diet full of sugar is not good for you. And that includes alcohol, unfortunately, everybody. Uh, and, and the doctors <laughs> that joined me today uh, confirmed that. And they also confirmed that, you know, living a Mediterranean lifestyle with a plant-based diet is still the best way to go. And, uh, you know, I felt that way for a long time. I watched my, my mother, my grandmother, all of my ancestors live a long, healthy life uh, with highly, you know, high cognitive function till the end, in most cases, uh, who ate a mostly plant-based diet. So it was, it was great to hear that. And it, it was also fun to hear them not tolerate excuses. There are uh, at least 50 questions from the audience. And, you know, we, we heard the typical, I don't have time. I don't know. I, I don't know. I live in a food desert and, and they had solutions for all of those situations. There are solutions for all the complications that we face in life. And uh, just just like uh, Jules' superpower is is movement, if you can cook even a little bit, that's that's another superpower that will really help you live a longer and healthier life. So if you're thinking about learning how to cook a little bit or learning how to make good food choices, this is a really great time to do it. It's never too late. Rafi, did, did anything that either of them say surprise you? We, we came into the sugar is sugar is sugar is sugar. Get rid of it. I was, I was a little surprised packaged. by that. Yeah. I've been a proponent of coconut nectar for a while. It's very high in fiber, very low on glycemic index. So it's, it's got a low sugar impact. It comes with a lot with a lot of the fiber that they spoke about being so important. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's a certain amount of uh you know, glucose that you consume when you consume any sugar. I was happy to hear that they support monk fruit and stevia. I've been a fan of both for a long time. There's still a tremendous amount of confusion when it comes to those two ingredients, confusing those with, you know, lab made chemicals that uh, appear to be natural sweeteners, but aren't. And uh, I was surprised to hear that coconut uh, manna, coconut butter, 
was not their favorite fat. I, I happen to love it for, you know, both external use and internal use. It's great as a beauty product. It's great as a food ingredient. Um, but uh, Dr. Shazai said no, no, no to, to coconut nectar, oh, coconut butter and bummer. coconut nectar. I don't think yeah. I knew that one either. Right. I'm going to have to no, go no, back no. and do more research. Yeah. 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 I think that one of the, I like what you said, Rocco, the last 10 years there has, we were talking originally, I was saying so much that's out there right now didn't exist when I was Lauren's age. And really in the that's last right. 10 years, we're talking about nutrition, food as medicine and food yes. as being able to reduce brain fog, improve mood. Uh, focus, uh, deal with type two diabetes in particular, how have you changed your own diet? How do you approach food differently based on what you're learning? About 15 years ago, I had an issue with declining health and I had that, that talk that everybody has with their doctor. Luckily I was still in my thirties and uh, I had to have wow. the big breakup with sugar. You know, it was, it was a tough breakup. There were a lot of tears it was definitely a toxic relationship, and that includes alcohol. And uh, listen, I still have I still have uh, my troubles with it, but um, getting rid of sugar and uh, sugar-based snacks and carb uh, simple carb-based snacks is an absolute must first step. Unless unless you're a triathlete or a dancer or, or someone who's burning five thousand calories a day, there's just no need for it, no use for it. Our bodies can't process it. We can't use it as fuel. We're going to store it as fat. Uh, it will cause brain fog. It will cause uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and, uh, mm. you know, I, I think, uh, like, like I've said in the past, if, you, if you've had a toxic relationship with a human being and felt the benefits <laughs> once you've gotten rid of that person <laughs> and know how it feels to be emancipated from that relationship, you'll feel the same with sugar. It'll feel immediately better. So give it a try, even for a day, you know. Okay, I've talked to a lot of people in this space. No one has equated no. it with the toxic relationship, but that's helpful. That's helpful, Rocco. I'm going to give it to you. I guess so. We'll, Next, go, we'll look at it that way. Sometimes I'm like, but I can't let go. I love you, sugar. I love you. <laughs> but he's right. You have Sometimes the doctor has to do it or your kid or someone who loves you has got to say, you know, no, yeah. stop this, yeah. right? And I yeah. think we're hearing yeah. a lot, certainly in this whole COVID period, we're, we're hearing a lot about mood, about brain fog, and, and kind of people are beginning to equate some of that with their food and what they eat in the morning and how they're able to concentrate. And also getting kids very early on on a nutrition program that helps with their learning, yeah. that helps with their attention, that helps with their brains. Yeah, right. and an active and an active lifestyle. You know, the the, the right. opposite exactly. of a sedentary lifestyle. We've we've all been sedentary for a long time now, and I, I think uh, we've all for, uh, forgotten a little bit what it's what it's like to be moving all the time. So, getting back to that uh, lifestyle quickly, I think we can all agree will have a positive impact. Um, I also really appreciated that the the both Dr. Shazai and Fen live in areas where they can forage local ingredients and they talk about local, but they also yeah. talk about cooking a lot. They both cook a lot and their favorite foods was pizza. They both eat a lot of pizza. So if there ever was a need for proof that healthy and delicious are not mutually exclusive, two uh, neuro, neuro uh, focused doctors, one's a neuroscientist, one is uh, originally an OB, OBGYN doctor, but is focused on yeah. uh, yeah, on the brain health now, uh, agreed that pizza is probably a great food to start with and part of the Mediterranean diet. I thought that was that was very surprising to me, but super fun. That that's great that's news. That's the best so thing break, I've heard all day. Yeah, break up with that toxic <laughs> sugar guy and, and start dating pizza. Find that's pizza that's we're gonna yeah. thank thank you, Rocco, so much for exactly you're we have welcome. A superpower in the kitchen. We have a superpower dancing with your body from these two extraordinary uh, individuals. I have to say, I'm looking for a different superpower, but yeah. I, I'm hoping that maybe eventually I'll, I'll have one of those. And we have somebody and, else. And, and of course, we have Liz Hernandez, who is joining us. She is a journalist um, who has prioritized brain health in her life. Um, and uh, she spoke with three amazing doctors about women and the role that uh, hormones play yeah. in brain health. Um, Liz, uh, did you learn anything new in your incredible conversation today? Well, first I wanna say, Maria, Lauren, thank you for having me. Yes, I felt very 
lucky to be sitting in a room with such educated, just all knowing women when it comes to dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay. What I took away was the three C's and that is that our brain wants to be cared for. Our brain needs compassion and our brain needs connection through community. And I'll start with the first one in being cared for just understanding that while our brain, a lot of times, uh, you know, whether it's pre-menopause, going through menopause, after menopause, there's a shift happening in the brain. And while that brain, our brains are changing, is that we have to make sure that we're looking at what is causing us extra stress, what isn't good for our diet, make sure that we're getting enough exercise, uh, Dr. Britton said it beautifully, our brain is an energy machine and we have to look at the flow of energy that's constantly coming in. So if that's just making sure that we're doing things that are putting us in a good space to use our brains cognitively, like learning a new skill set, um, making sure again that we are looking at what we're consuming, you know, because we're just talking about sugar, um, also just other bad habits, maybe that smoking and how that actually affects women more than it does men. I mean, there was just so many things that you're just kind of taken back at what women are more predisposed to and what can really affect us in a different way. And so for me, that was very enlightening um, and just compassion. You know, we talked a lot about the importance of getting quiet and having meditation and what that does just to our stress levels of making sure that we're just mindful in how we are processing all the information that is coming at us on a daily basis. And just, you know, even if, uh, I think Dr. Caldwell said it best, she says, even if you're sitting for five minutes and just saying to yourself, I'm thinking a lot right now, it's self-awareness to say, I'm thinking a lot right now. And at least you're kind of mm -hmm. learning to calm down the nervous system a little bit. And the importance of connection and community of not isolating ourselves is extremely important as well. It's making sure that our synapses are firing, that we're getting those new experiences. And uh, overall, I think too, another thing that was really important to highlight was just the fear of if someone in our family has had Alzheimer's or dementia and feeling like that is my destiny and that is not the case, mm. you know? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Moscone said it best, you know, you can say, I'm, I am my mother. I look just like her. We have the same hair. We have the same nose. We have the same eyes or the same smile. That doesn't mean you're going to get dementia or Alzheimer's. What that, she says, it only raises your percentage about 20 to 30%, but it really comes down to our lifestyles, how we're caring for ourselves, looking at the risk factors. And I'll go back to those three C's, making sure we're caring for the brain, making sure we're compassionate with the brain. And that means self-talk and of course, connection and community. So I was really excited. What a beautiful <laughs> I've summary. I've heard that before. Yeah, I love that. And, yeah. and uh, Liz has, uh, like uh, you, her mother had Alzheimer's. She's been on the front lines of this uh, disease and advocacy for it. So we're so grateful, Liz, that you uh, moderated this panel because you know what it's like uh, firsthand as the child of Alzheimer's. And I know you've taken steps in your own life to change the way you're living, to change your health journey, to change your brain health journey because of what you saw with your mom. And how have the, what are the big changes you've made yourself? Uh, well, one of the things I want to say, Maria, too, that I thought was really important that Dr. Moscone brought up, how important it is for us to be participants in studies. So I gave her my word right. that I'm actually <laughs> going to sign up to be a part of their studies because I do want oh, right. to know where my starting point is now at the age I am so that in 10 years from now, they can actually say if they see anything, they know what my starting point looks like, but not only for right. myself, but we have to be participants so that we can have sessions like this and get information. And I think that's so important. Um, but how I've changed my lifestyle, I have dove deep into meditation. I do it every single day, even if it's just taking in 10 deep breaths and getting present with myself. It's, you know, just for me to kind of reset again, the nervous system, because I know that's really impacting how I get through my day. I exercise. Uh, I try to cut out sugar. I really do. Um, I used to be a big, I have to have dessert after every meal <laughs> type person, even if that meant like a little Hershey's kiss here or a little. And now I, I have fruit. I make sure that my house is filled with 
even if it's like oranges, something that's kind of sweet, like um, mango, anything that has that sugary, but it's natural sugar. Um, and I'm still working on cutting out the alcohol. I think that's a hard one. I think, you know, after a while, <laughs> a of red wine or, you know, some, maybe something yeah. a little stronger, but, uh, you know, that's the only thing, but I, I, I am really mindful in making sure that I try to put myself in situations where I'm learning new things, where I'm challenging myself yeah. before it was so easy to say like, Oh, I don't really need to know that skill set. I don't really, and now I'm like, what else can I learn? Somebody teach me something to challenge my brain, even if it's, you know, and, and you do, you read those small, small articles about brush your teeth with your left hand because it's going to fire off other parts of your brain. I mean, those are, those have stood the test of time, those little tips, because they actually do work. Take a different route home. I mean, all those little things help the brain and its elasticity and it, for us to just, you know, continuously, um, supply ourselves, which is new, new, small experiences. They don't have to be these big, extraordinary life events. They could be something so small. That's just, again, firing off new neurons. Liz, thank you so that. much. And thank you for the commitment to join a trial. We talked about that at the beginning, yeah. uh, how many trials depend on people signing up and people of all ages, all communities, because that's how the science that's where the data comes from. That's where we get the superpower. That's where we learn. And so uh, thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for being the advocate and uh, activist you've been in this space. And I know you will continue to be. So thank you so much. I love that everybody has made these small incremental changes, mm -hmm. whether it's moving more, whether it's trying to make advancements with getting rid of sugar, breaking up with sugar. Um, but, you know, a lot of the things that people are talking about meditation, now we want to talk with, we had a whole panel we with did. Malika Chopra on meditation. And that's something that I started uh, several years ago. Lauren can't believe it, but it's true. I swear to God. We're sitting still? I don't know. <laughs> it's true. And Malika, what, what you've done so much in this space, you've written books, we've worked together before. Anything surprise you in your panel? You know, it was an amazing panel. So one, thank you for including me. It's such an honor. Um, we had Dr. Dharma Khalsa, um, who is one of the experts on integrative medicine, Lauren Lakeland Hogan, um, who really focuses on caregivers, and Dr. Karen Epps um, from Emory University, who's also working um, in particular with nurses and African-American communities. So I think in general, we talked about um, spiritual fitness, what everyone here has talked about. In fact, it's so great to hear the other panelists, because I will mm -hmm. say that um, even from a personal standpoint during COVID, I never used to really drink much. I kind of got in the habit of having like one little whiskey every night. And after three or four months, I realized, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, and it's about being kind of self-reflective, forcing myself to exercise and move. So I think we've gone through a year and a half where we all really have to reflect. And that's where meditation and these practices come into play. Um, Maria, you're a great example, actually, of someone who says, oh, I can't sit still, but you know, sometimes it can be as simple as taking a deep breath in and out. And that's what we tried to do as we began uh, this session and ended the session, because so much of this is about practice. Um, and so right. um, the panelists shared everything from um, love and self-love, something Dr. Epps talked about, particularly uh, with Black communities and reaching out to Black churches, um, looking at prayer as a form um, of both personal, um, spiritual, and community connection. Uh, and, you know, all of those levels affect, obviously, our brain health and overall health. Um, Dr. Kulsa talked about purpose. Uh, and so that also, we don't necessarily associate that with meditation, um, but having a sense of purpose and service is part of traditions, wisdom traditions around the world. And so we can always add that to a meditation practice. Um, and then uh, Dr. Hogan actually talked a lot about um, self-care for caregivers, for nurses, 
and um, the importance of support groups, asking for help. Um, so while uh, the conversation was around meditation, faith, and emotional well-being, it really incorporates um, that holistic, integrative lifestyle. Um, and I loved uh, Dr. Kozlo uses this uh, term spiritual fitness. Um, and so, you know, how do we merge stress reduction, basic well-being, and psychological, spiritual well-being uh, into all of our practices. I love that. I love the description of spiritual yes. fitness. It really like it like creates such an image in my mind to create purpose while you're working out, which I think yeah. is so important to just move your mind. Yeah. You don't have to move your body. You can move your mind and that can help your journey and help your brain. And you can quiet your mind. You're actually, there's so much coming at people today. And I think so many people, when they're talking about the brain health journey, right? They talk about, uh, you know, relaxing, getting rid of the stress. And that's so much easier. I used to hate when somebody said to me, relax. You know, I'm like, I would if I could, hello. <laughs> but I think that meditation or looking at it as spiritual fitness yeah. yeah, as a different connotation, it's why words are so important, right? Malika, you just kind of think about it as a, as a practice, as a purpose, and as, a, as spiritual fitness for your brain, that'll help you. And, you know, I think one of the things I've learned in working with children is find, just like everyone else said, find what practice works best for you. So sitting quietly for a lot of people, um, especially like when you're with 10-year-old boys, you're not going to get 10-year-old boys <laughs> uh, to sit still for that long, but you can um, direct energy to, you know, using your body and your breath, um, to going for walks in nature, to using yoga or exercise or fitness. So there are different, we use this overall term of meditation or mindfulness, which can right. feel daunting. Um, but if we really think of it as kind of breath, connection, um, and uh, self-reflection, I think that helps make it more tangible. I love that. I, I, we want to thank you so much for uh, moderating your session. So important on spiritual fitness, on meditation, on purpose, on quieting. That makes us better parents, better professionals, better providers, better people. And certainly, I think that's what the world needs. We don't, we see a lot of examples of rage out there right now. So it behooves us all to become mindful and to kind of take responsibility for bringing our temperatures down, whether we're on social media, in a car, in a community, right? And yeah. that's so great. And I know everybody will have a chance to watch that panel if you weren't able to get in. And once again, we apologize uh, for everybody not being able to get into all of these panels. We didn't uh, uh, know that there were going to be so many people trying to get in at the same time. So that's the good news, bad news. But you'll be able to watch all of these panels. Uh, you'll be able to look at all of them as superpowers. I think in conclusion, you'll be able to find out about hormones, about women's health in particular. You'll be able to find out about spiritual fitness, about nutrition, the importance, the importance of nutrition. And then again, of movement, like Julianne Huff was saying, you know, the importance of making that fun, moving it around. And we want to thank all four of you for joining us. They all volunteered uh, their services. And once again, we, we want to thank them for taking time out of their very busy schedules for doing that. And our thank sponsors. You so much. Amaz yes, we had incredible sponsors today. Of course, we've mentioned Biogen and ASI, um, of course, Kensington Senior Living, yes, great. who are incredible partners to us. Home Instead, always such great friends to us. Eli Lilly and Cole and Accenture. I everyone has to come together to change the course of this disease. And these organizations are always so generous yeah. uh, to support us and our work. And so we thank you uh, so much for helping make today happen. Yes. And these are all organizations and people who have stayed the course, right? This has been kind of a, a tough field. Uh, not a lot of hope in the all side. We always heard about this failed and that failed. And all of these sponsors have been in the space. They didn't give up just like all of our moderators. They've been <laughs> out there. They've been working in their chosen professions. They've been trying. They've been working and they've been friends of uh, our organization. So together with our sponsors, with our moderators, and obviously all of you who came together, we have some winners. Remember we had, you had to text at the beginning of uh, our Brain It On 
uh, brain health journey event today. And we said, if you texted brain, what was the number? Nine, brain, 91999. 91999. Like we have number. some, there's, okay. So we have Marie Racine, mm-hmm. Julie Richardson, Maria Flowers, Cece Madden, and Darlene Fahi Britton. Yes. So they need to check their email for a link to the after party. And that when they get that link, when you go on your email, you'll get a link and then you'll join us at the after party. I've never done an after party. I mean, of course, I've been to an after party in my life, but I haven't been to a Zoom she after, has an party. after party. Yeah. Sure, she hasn't. <laughs> there's not going to be any sugar at the after party. No. Okay. There's going to be alcohol. There's going to be no alcohol, <laughs> no sugar. It'll oh be my. a brain healthy after party. Oh which, my God. Is that going to be fun? Be a, it'll still be a party. Yeah. We have a, a special guest. We're going to laugh at this after party, right? We're, we're not, we don't, do we have any food? We, we have food. We have stats. We've, the people who are attending have received a brain health box. Yes. Um, we're going to unpack it together like a little gift, um, Good. gift of brain health. No cookies in there. There are no cookies. In there, there are no cookies. Okay. No. Well, we'll try to eat healthy. We want to thank everybody thank for you. joining us for Brain It On. Don't forget, you will get all four of these um, uh, breakout sessions direct to your inbox. We want to thank you so much. And next time we're going to plan for thousands and thousands of more people who will crash into these uh, seminars. But we want to thank you so much for joining us. I'm Maria Shriver. I'm Lauren Miller-Rogan. And we want to thank you for taking this journey with us. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.